Was it an accident or a crash? It doesn't really matter. And we'll tell you why this week on Motor in 2005. SN's Motoring 2005 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. You know, there was a day when TV commercials were fairly straightforward for car companies. You showcased the vehicle's performance and design because that's what people wanted. But as we all know, safety today plays a big part in any vehicle's success. So much so that a lot of car companies actually brag about their crash results. In fact, in some TV commercials, rather than see the car driving through the countryside, you're more apt to see it slamming into a concrete wall. Well, this week, we're going to visit one of the most sophisticated crash centers in the world. It's located in Gothenburg, Sweden, and the company is the same company that introduced the three-point seatbelt in 1959. And that company is Volvo. Safety has been with the company since the very beginning when we, when we started more than 75 years ago. And, and uh, to be, stay competitive, to be in a leading position, we need all these facilities, we need equipment, we need the tools, whether it's physical testing or CAE work. The crash laboratory is uh, a hole, crash hole, where the crashes are conducted. And in addition to that, we have two tracks where the car is coming from. And one of these tracks is movable, so we can adjust this track in different angles to track one. By that, we can adjust the entire laboratory into specific traffic accident situation, where we can reproduce a real-life accident in a laboratory environment. It takes uh, about a week to prepare a test, to do the test setup. Uh, for, I was speaking about two cars, car to car testing, uh, that might be double that time. And uh, uh, the, what takes time is all the positioning of the instruments, uh, the cameras, the transducers and everything. And then it takes probably another week just to analyze all the results and come to a conclusion. We have special dummies for rear-end impacts in order to evaluate how the neck is affected by rear-end impact, for instance. We have special dummies for side impacts, as we know that people are injured in side impact in a different way that they are in a frontal impact. So therefore we have to use different dummies with different sensory in each individual dummy for different type of impacts. Slowly we're getting into the situation where we can simulate the human being more correctly in a computer model than by building a test dummy. The big advantage with computers is that you, you're able to change your parameters, for example the speed of an impact, and, and look at what happens if you increase the speed a mile an hour, what happens then? Do you have a different situation and how can you optimize the car against that? We can simulate up to 14 full-scale crash tests every 24 hours, around the clock, seven days a week. It's very busy and it's becoming even more busy by every day now. Uh, this year, for example, we're running some 150 crash tests for our own Volvo vehicles, but in addition to that, as many, another 150 for Ford, Jaguar, Aston Martin, Land Rover. So all, to, all in all, 300 tests per year. Most of the tests would be uh, in the range of fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars, excluding the vehicles. Rollovers uh, 
have been around for a number of years, of course, but they are increasingly important. And if you look at, for example, U.S. accident statistics, rollover fatal accidents account for some 25 percent of all fatalities. The XC90 is Volvo's first venture into the sport utility market, and the company is well aware that this segment has a reputation for rollovers. Being leading in safety, or the ambition to be leaders in safety, uh, as we have on all our cars, it was extremely obvious for us that we have to consider and take care of this accident type, so to speak. And uh, what we have done now is we have made, in our opinion, a major step to improve accidents to happen, rollover accidents to happen, but also the protection if you, by any reason, run into it. And every car can run into a rollover accident, as you know. The dynamics of the car is so good that you very, very seldom run in to the borderline into a rollover accident. Once you are there, because it could happen, of course, avoiding a child, avoiding an accident, whatever it is, uh, you have to be helped by the car. And we have this roll stability control program in this car, which normally will take care of any problems on a normal road. Taking care of people buying our cars is well, it's mandatory for us. We don't discuss it, we do it. Traffic safety is much more than the vehicle itself. It's also who I act as a driver, mm -hmm. that I take my responsibility to not drive too fast, not drive under influence of drugs, put on the safety belt, restrain my children, etc. I have to do my part in this very important interplay between the human, the vehicle and the traffic environment. It's happening, but I think that the human can improve himself to do better. Increases your paranoia like looking in the mirror and seeing a police car. Ask your grandfather. More later on Kenzie's Corner. At one time, a compact pickup truck was little more than a pint-sized replica of the real thing. Well, times are changing as this week on Test Drive, we take a look at a much bigger and certainly bolder Toyota Tacoma. When compared to last year's model, the 2005 Tacoma Double Cab 4x4 is a whopping 486 millimeters longer, 205 mil wider, and it now rides on a 3,570 millimeter wheelbase which represents a massive 475 mil stretch. Now these expanded dimensions put the more aptly described mid-sized Tacoma within hailing distance of Toyota's own almost full-size Tundra. The nice part, however, is that ballooning the size does not make the Tacoma feel as ponderous as its larger sibling, especially when the sport package is part of the mix. When you climb behind the wheel of the Tacoma, well, you could be getting into any top-class sedan. First and foremost, great materials, a two-tone finish, and some really lovely satiny silver accents dotted throughout. Now, that sport package, well, it also helps in here. You get much better sport bucket seats that are form-hugging and very comfortable over the long haul. You also get a much-needed radio upgrade. But there are, however, two things I really do not care for. First, that silly hood scoop. It's fake and therefore not functional, so why bother? Now the other thing are these silly running boards. The only thing they ever do for you is get crap all over the back of your pant legs. Now to add insult to injury, they're going to cost you 365 bucks, plus of course the cleaning bill. On the handling side, this package adds Bilstein Shops larger 265-65R17 tires mounted on attractive aluminum rims and a limited slip differential. Now the base suspension is pretty good as it delivers a crisp feel to steering input while controlling body well quite well. 
The TRD bits and pieces make a big difference as the Tacoma now tracks an even truer line and this in spite of its taller stance and elevated ground clearance. Simply the better shots control the rest of the suspension with more authority and so while you never quite forget you're behind the wheel of a truck, this is about as good as it gets. You know, lockable storage space is often a problem with a pickup truck, but in the Tacoma, not a problem at all. Now, if you need to carry a dirty old box, you simply lift up the seat base, remove the headrest, ah, drop the seat back down, and you end up with a nice hard plastic back on the seat, which means you don't have to put that dirty box on the fabric. Where the Tacoma disappoints is in the 4x4 department as it only earns a part-time system. Not only is this completely out of step with the rest of the truck, it means that it's all but useless when you're on road. Here, a system with a set and forget automatic mode is very much needed. Off-road, however, the system pays big dividends as it makes the most challenging boonie bashing a cakewalk. If you do select four low, well, the Tacoma trundles up impossibly steep grades without breaking so much as a sweat. In terms of utility, this Tacoma is just about as functional as a full-size truck. To begin with, a bed length of six foot two with the tailgate up. Drop it down, then it extends it to darn near eight feet, which means you can carry a four by eight sheet of building material in the back without risking it falling out. You also get plenty of tie downs, some storage boxes to carry the rope that you need to carry. A couple of options, a plastic floor mat, which means the stuff doesn't slide around anywhere near as much as normal and of course a 115 volt outlet. Now where the whole thing falls apart, this thing has got such a wimpy exhaust note, it just doesn't sound like the workhorse that it really is. The sin of course is that the Tacoma is anything but wimpy as the power now comes from a 4 litre V6 with variable valve timing. The good news is that it churns out a V8 like 245 horsepower and a very healthy 282 pounds feet of torque which is 55 and 62 respectively more than last year's, well, rather wimpy 3.4 litre motor. When married to the new 5-speed automatic transmission, the Tacoma not only beavers its way to a metric ton in 7.7 .7 seconds, it bridges the 80 to 120 gap in a very impressive 6.8 seconds. If you need utility but don't want the ponderous feel that comes free of charge with a full-size pickup truck, well, this new Tacoma is a very good place to start. It has the utility, it's got a very good engine, and it handles remarkably well, and that in spite of it being a jacked up 4x4. The bottom line, if you're in the market for a pickup truck, this thing manages to out-truck its immediate competition with ease. Our Midas tip of the week concerns winter spec fuels. You've probably heard the oil companies advertise their winter fuels and thought that that just involved a little bit of gasoline antifreeze blended with the regular fuel. Well, there's a lot more to it than that. Butane is one of the components that's often blended with winter spec fuels to allow your engine to fire up on a sub-zero morning. You need the fuel to vaporize readily at extremely low temperatures in order to start an internal combustion engine in sub-zero temps. Without butane and other additives in that fuel, you just wouldn't have the vaporization to get the engine fired up in the first place. Now, it's usually a non-issue, not a problem that you have to deal with, with with your car or truck. It's just interesting information. But where it comes into play is with your small engines. For example, if you go to your garage or garden shed and get out a jerry can that's got gas in it that you put in your lawnmower or rotor tiller in June, July, or August, try and use it in your snowblower in December or January, you may not even get the thing started. And you may go looking for a problem that really isn't there. If you want it to fire up in the wintertime, Make sure you buy the gas in the winter time as well. That's your Midas tip of the week.
is our seventh year that we've put on our annual open house for uh, Ultimate Customs hosts it. Uh, we have about 200, 250 cars showing up today and we charge $5 a head to get in here. All the money goes to Sick Kids Hospital. This is a 1989 GMC Sierra pickup truck. It was bought by my dad in uh, 1990 and driven to work every day for five or six years until he decided to put it into a shop and uh, completely customize it. It's got a four inch uh, drop in the front, uh, six and a half inches in the back. Everything operates on solenoids, custom interior. Uh, unfortunately, my dad worked on it for almost two years with Ultimate Customs in Ajax, but he passed away just before it was finished. And, we had it finished for him, and um, we, we try to show it a couple of times each year. It's a uh, half-scale 1923T. Uh, it uh, runs on a 12 and a half horsepower Briggs & Stratton engine. Uh, it has a three-speed transmission, lights, horn, working front suspension, uh, full gauges that are functional. Uh, this uh, particular car took me uh, about a year uh, to fabricate the chassis and mold the body and uh, you know there's a little bit of tinkering. I go to a lot of shows in the states and uh, this car is a little more convenient to ride around on rather than walking. Uh, nobody as far as I know has ever done one this size. Um, <laughs> you see a lot of double takes. They, they look and then they look again and uh, it's basically just like a full-size car except half the size. As we heard earlier, over 300 vehicles each year are crash tested at the Volvo Safety Center in Gothenburg, Sweden. And they could be getting a lot busier in the near future. Because as we all know, Volvo is part of the Ford family and soon they'll be testing Fords, especially the European models, along with other members of the Ford group, Jaguar, Aston Martin and Land Rover. All right, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Brad, I got involved with a really interesting job a while back. One of my customers, who I hadn't seen for a while, took his GM all-wheel drive van into a major repair chain to get an estimate done on a major vibration problem that he had with his vehicle. At highway speeds, this thing was shaking like crazy. Now, he came back with an estimate for new tires, uh, some brake work, some major front end work, idler arms, tie rod ends, shocks, a, a wheel alignment, etc. And the cumulative total of the parts and the repair, wheel alignment, etc., and the labor was around $2,000. It was a pretty big repair operation requ required. And he was okay with spending that money as long as it was going to fix his problem, but he just wanted that second opinion. Now, I looked at the van, and before I drove it, sure enough, the tires were bad. It needed some front end work, and it sure needed an alignment, and I'm sure it needed shocks, etc. This was from a wear and tear standpoint, but as soon as I got in that van and drove it and got up to about 80 or 90 kilometers, I realized that the frequency of the vibration that he had in this vehicle was way above wheel tire speed and everything that they'd estimated was at the wheel tire end of things. I knew right away we had a vibration that was caused in the drive line. I thought it probably had a U-joint gone, but as it turned out, there was a component in the drive line uh, that was completely out of lubricant and that was the transfer case. This assembly known as the transfer case is what makes a four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive what it is. It divides the power. Now it bolts to the back of your transmission right up here and it sends power out the rear shaft to the rear drive axle right here. And up here via this flange and another drive shaft heading to the front axle, it transfers power to your front axle. Now this assembly, although it's bolted up into the trans transmission of your vehicle, it's lubricated as a separate entity. There's a drain plug here and a filler plug right in here and usually approximately two liters of, in most cases, automatic transmission fluid lubricating and protecting this entire assembly. Now in this particular unit, the oil seal at the back that keeps that fluid in had come out. It was back on the drive shaft right here and you can see that this, the leading edge of the drive shaft is all turned blue and purple right here from heat and what it did was it ruined the bushing that's in here as well, completely ruined it, and all the lubricant came out. When I took the uh, drain plug out of this unit, not a drop of lubricant came out. Now there's where the transfer case bolts to the back of your transmission, and I think that the, what happens a lot of times is guys don't realize that this transfer case is a separate entity and lubricated as such. So you've got to make sure that if you have your four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive vehicle in for servicing, make sure they know 
what type of fluid goes in here, that it's lubricated separately, and that it's filled up completely full of lubricant every time that vehicle is serviced. And it's changed periodically as well. Now he still needed the front end work and tire work, but at least he knew exactly what answered the problem with the vibration on his van. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2005. A lot of trucking companies these days have these how's my driving 1-800 numbers on the side of the truck, the theory being that if the driver knows his behavior can be reported to his boss, well, maybe he'll behave a little better. And some people think we should all have our names on our vehicles. If we eliminated the anonymity of driving, well, maybe we'd all behave a little more politely. But there's another group of drivers that we ought to be worried about too. These are the ones that have police about a foot and a half high written on every surface of the vehicle. Now. I know the cops have a tough job to do, but they're out there enforcing the law. Don't you think they should be setting a good example? And how many times have you seen a police cruiser roll on through a stop sign or weave it through traffic without putting his turn signals on or driving along with his coffee in one hand and his uh, low fat, high energy bar in the other, steering with his knees? Now, I'm not talking about it when they're pursuing somebody. If they got the lights and sirens on, get the heck out of the way and let them get on and do their job. I'm talking about just everyday driving. Now. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of the police. They do a great job. I wouldn't take their job in a million years. But guys, you gotta be setting a good example. And as far as criticizing you, yeah, well, I love my kids too. That doesn't stop me from giving them a little constructive criticism. I'm Jim Kenzie. Before we go, I just want to remind you that next week is our one hour car of the year special when we and you, the viewer, select the best vehicle for the year 2005. You won't want to miss it. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Picking the car of the year for 2005 was a particularly difficult job, primarily because there were three very good candidates. TSN's Motoring 2005 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. <laughs>